Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, in this class we will be looking at another cognitive variable or another cognitive factor which is attention. Now, attention is a very interesting cognitive factor because uh, it uh, signifies the mental concentration, the mental effort somebody uh, puts it to. And so, attention is uh, important why because attention decides uh, whether perception takes place or not. So, even before something is perceived, even before something is registered by the brain uh, and uh, analyzed, attention decides what uh, message is to be analyzed, what stimuli is to be analyzed and what stimuli is not to be analyzed. Now, why is attention really necessary? Think of a scenario where uh, you could hear uh, uh, a lot of things you could hear almost all the stimuli which are impinging onto you at any given moment. It would be very difficult to process all the stimuli at any if every stimuli is being impinging on you, you are able to hear everything. And so, focusing or concentration would be difficult, and that is why uh, the cognitive system or our uh, human brain has the system of attention. So, attention is just like a sieve or a filter which uh, separates those information which needs to be processed and those information which need not be processed. And so, uh, basically then the question comes in that how is attention directed. So, in this particular lecture we will look into attention, we look into what are the factors which control attention, how is attention manipulated and whether this attention uh, that we are talking about whether uh, uh, this could be improved. So, uh, does attention span improve? We will also look at some of the theories of attention and talk about something called automaticity of attention. In addition to it, we will also look at something called the psychological refractive period, which is basically a caveat, which is basically uh, uh, out process of attention. So, let us then begin our uh, section on attention. Think of a scenario, a car driving scenario. Look at the picture on the screen. Now, when an expert driver car uh, drives a car, he does not need to pay attention to a lot of variable, to a lot of things. He is an expert and so driving is uh, kind of a byproduct to him and so he does not need to focus on all the systems uh, which are there in the car like the gear, the steering and so many other things. Uh, so, what he could do an expert could do is not only drive the car, but also uh, start a conversation, follow a conversation, fiddle with some gadgets, take up a phone call and do several other things. But reverse the scenario or look at, look at the scenario in the picture. In the picture you can see a novice driving a car. Remember the first time you started driving a car or a vehicle. Now, at that point of time you did not know what the controls were and you did not know so many other things about the car or about the vehicle that you were drawing or any new thing that you learn. And so, you had to put your attention or your mental concentration into it, because this mental concentration decides how you should be doing a particular job. In, in case of the car, the novice user pays attention to whatever is happening around him, learns about the control, learns about how to move the vehicle and later on when he practices for some time, when he has enough practice for some time, he can then uh, use something called divided attention, where he does not need to focus all his mental effort onto the controls in car and uh, uh, with the driving can do other jobs as well. So, basically attention is a mental effort uh, 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 kind of a, a, a cognitive resource which makes you focus on two things. Now, remember 
in earlier classes, in smaller classes, our teachers used to say pay attention. And the caveat here was that no matter how hard we paid attention, it used to jump from one object to another. Even if I ask you right now to pay attention to something uh, or, or some object, what would happen is that for a few seconds you would be able to focus your attention onto that thing and it jumps on, which basically means that attention is very fiddly. It keeps on jumping from one uh, thing to another and that is why we have something called an attention span, which basically defines the amount of time for which a particular stimulus can be attended to. So, then what is basically attention? Attention basically requires the study of cognitive resources and the limitations of the cognitive system. So, basically those cognitive psychologists who are studying attention actually look at uh, what are the cognitive resources, how are the cognitive resources channelized into uh, making a cognitive decision, making a cognitive uh, act like perception, memory and what are the limitations of uh, this, this attention, this filter that we are talking about. So, attention is sometimes also synonymously uh, related or synonymously uh, considered uh, equivalent to mental concentration. Now, attention is something which is very preeminent. Without attention, it would be uh, really difficult. And so, as I said, as you do more and more practice, what you could do is you could take the attention that you have. Uh, the amount of attention that is the your cognitive resources that is available to you and put it into other jobs, which means that people can simultaneously then do much any other job. So, one basic fact to know here is that with practice attention span or attention can be diverted, you could uh, use your attention for doing multiple jobs. That is the question which I have here and that says that does people's concentration change with practice. The question is does people's attention actually go ahead and change uh, with practice with uh, uh, doing or with doing the job over and over again or learning the job over and over again. Now, one of the first person to talk about attention was William James when he said that attention cannot be focused on one uh, on uh, more than one stimuli. He he predicted that attention can be only paid on on or attention can be studied for only one stimuli, but if we are diverting or if we are playing around with many stimuli, if we are focusing ourselves or we, if we are able to do a number of jobs at the same time, it is not attention that we are studying, it is habit that, that we are studying. And so, this uh, first definitions or these first clues basically give us something about or tell us something about automaticity, which is another outgrowth of attention. So, as you become more practiced, as you have more practice, you do not need uh, a lot of attention onto jobs and so, most of the jobs then become automatic. Think about any morning, any unusual morning which is there and so, when you get up, you go to doing your brushing and uh, there are several other things. But if I ask you this question, do you remember doing any of these? or do you pay attention to any of these jobs very seriously and your answer would be no. The reason being that these are so uh, routine jobs that there is a process of doing it and so what you tend to do when after you get up is pay less and less attention to it and the process itself becomes automatic till the point of time when you either miss a toothpaste or there is a one uh, element from the whole routine that is not existing. And if that happens, your attention is focused back onto the situation and solving a problem with the situation. So, the study of attention is also important because at any given point of time, we have limited cognitive resources. The brain has limited cognitive resources and these cognitive resources have to be diverted is to be used in a number of jobs that we have to do and so, we have to use it wisely and that is why attention came comes into play where it allocates, where it helps in allocating uh, these mental concentration into getting more uh, eminent or uh, more uh, important jobs done and making those jobs which are routine as more uh, automatic and uh, more uh, sequential in nature. Now, the question is how do we study attention? A problem is how do we study attention?
And a more relevant question here is that can attention be paid to multiple stimuli? Let us deal with the first question. How do we study attention? The moment you say somebody, the moment you ask somebody not to pay attention onto something, his attention goes back into that particular job. And so, it is really difficult to study attention because if you ask someone, the only way I see of studying attention is taking two groups, one group which is paying attention and the other group which is not paying attention. But as soon as you release this instruction, as an experimental psychologist, I would say that as soon as you give this instruction to people not to pay attention, there goes it he starts paying attention back to whatever job you are not asked him to pay attention and that is because human beings are curious. They will do what they are not asked to do. So, how do we study attention? The only way to study it is to have two groups in which one uh, group does not pay attention. And so, a novel design was uh, used to study attention. We will talk about this design in a moment, but before that let us look at this question of can we pay attention to two things at the same time. There are several answers to it and several theories we will discuss into it. Think of a class, a class which is filled uh, with a uh, number of students who is actually listening to a professor who is professing. At any point of time, there are so many stimuli which is being imprinting on your sense organs. You have a number of stimuli interactions, a number of stimuli which is trying to capture its attention, but what you tend to do is focus yourself onto the lecture and this particular thing or this particular job of focusing your attention onto one particular thing is what is called selective attention. So, selective attention basically is selective attention is basically using the filter to focus on one job and to eliminate other jobs to eliminate putting your focus onto other jobs. So, as soon as the teacher stops teaching, you will soon start hearing your cloth wrestling against yourself, uh, your skin, you can hear the noise that the person who is sitting right next to you uh, uh, is making, you can hear the fan, the noise of the fan which was there. But amazingly, when you were actually looking at uh, the professor uh, when he is teaching, you actually did not pay any attention uh, to all the other sounds which were there. And this particular thing, this interesting thing of focusing your attention onto one particular job or one particular uh, event is called selective attention. And so, what we will be looking at now is something called selective attention. But even before looking at selective attention, let the question is how do we study attention. And so, a very ingenious design was used to do that and that design is uses something called di, uh, the dichotic listening task. So, as I said selective attention is the term which refers to the fact that we usually focus out attention onto few tasks and events rather than many of this particular task. And Hal Pasher one of the uh, famous figures in attention research uh, states that attention is basically equivalent to uh, any given woman's people's awareness. Uh, and it encompasses, it comprises of only a tiny proportion of the stimuli which he is receiving from the environment. Now, let us do a very quick uh, thing, a very quick study to find out how selective attention really works. And so, on the display in front of you, you see uh, two rows of animals. Now, what here has happened is most of the figures that you see are actually a combination of a dog and a cat and there are some pure figures. When I say pure figures, uh, you, what I really mean is a pure dog and a pure cat. Take some time and do tell me or you uh, do do this exercise of finding out which is the uh, cat, pure cat and which is the pure dog. Now, once you are given this job, you will soon realize the only pure dog is this and the only pure cat is this. Now, how did you come up with this answer? For finding out this answer, what you really needed to do is to scan 
each of these image one by one and for that what you needed to do is to focus all your attention or mental concentration focus yourself into this image and basically compare the prototype as we saw in the perception se uh, section prototype is basically the most abstract abstraction that you have the most clear abstraction that you have of any category use that prototype to compare each of this image with a pure dog image and a pure cat image and once you do that you will realize that the fifth image from the left on the top row is the dog a pure dog and similarly the third image from the left bottom uh, on, on, on the bottom row is a pure cat and what you did right now when you did this job of finding the pure cat and pure dog is something called selective attention. So, the idea here was how do we go ahead and study attention and as I mentioned a few minutes before the, uh, the best way to do that is using something called a dichotic listening task. Now, what is this task all about? So, this dichotic task listening task involves a listener a person who listens through a headphone. Now, the on the cavet here, the hidden part here is that both the heads or both the channels or both the ears that this person has will be receiving two different inputs. So, one ear will be receiving a different input and the other ear will be receiving a different input. When I mean input, what it really means is that they will be re uh, receiving two different messages. So, it is a situation like this where you can see uh, the one ear is receiving uh, stimuluses like ga, go, ge kind of thing and the other uh, ear is using stimulus like ba, bi, uh, something like that. So, basically per the people who take part in the dichotic listening task are given an earphone and the two ears then receive different messages. Now, there are some uh, the uh, obviously, there are some assumptions here or there are some clue uh, 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 th there are some points to be noted here instructions that to be followed. The first thing is that the people have to shadow one ear. Now, what does shadowing actually really mean? Now, shadowing means to repeat aloud whatever you are hearing in a particular ear that the experimenter is asking you to do. So, in the dichotic listening task, what you really have to do is both the ears that uh, that you have received two different inputs from two different microphones to two, two different headphones and uh, all you have to do is to shadow one ear. Now, shadowing is repeating aloud whatever you hear on one of the ears. So, if it, it is the right ear that you are shadowing whatever is coming to your right ear you are going to repeat that aloud. Now, the rate of presentation of stimuli in, in a dichotic listening task is very fast it is nearly 150 words per minute. At the end of the task, people are asked to reveal what information that they have gathered from the message from both the ears or from a single ear. And so, the deal here is that this experiment or this uh, dichotic listening task was designed by someone called Cherry in the year 1953. In a classic study, Cherry defined this uh, dichotic listening task. Now, the question was there are two different years on one year you are doing shadowing the other year you are not doing shadowing. The question is whether you are able to hear words from the year that you are not shadowing which means that whether you are able to hear from the year that you are not paying attention to. The answer to this cherry got was that yes most people were able to hear some information some messages or some kind of uh, uh, stimulus property from the other ear and uh, this uh, information was basically uh, towards uh, or uh, uh, towards stimulus properties like what is the uh, 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 what is the message type whether it is noise or whether it is words which is being repeated uh, or uh, who is speaking whether it is a female or a male who is speaking. Uh, whether it is uh, the message is in a correct order which is a forward order or whether the messages are in reverse order. This kind of information basic stimulus information you can gather from the non uh, in, intended or non attended ear, but from the right ear you, you tend to hear everything. So, basically this question here or this uh, uh, property here tells us that 
people are able to hear some kind of uh, information from the other ear. So, basically attending to one stimulus does not mean that the information from the other ear will not come in or will not uh, be attended to. So, basic information or basic facts from the other ear is also attended to like stimulus properties related to uh, basic message properties that is what is attended to. And so, when uh, Cherry related this, uh, this particular thing, he uh, he said that the unintended year or he found out that his subjects from the unintended year although uh, could not uh, analyze the message uh, the meaning of the message from the unintended year, but they could tell the voice of the person who was repeating it. Uh, 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 the uh, kind of uh, uh, message that it was, whether it was noise, white noise which was being presented or it was words and uh, uh, letters that was being repeated and whether it was the forward or the backward direction. Now, what they could not tell of the message which was being played and the non intended year was whether the, what was the language in which it was, it was being played and what was the content of the message. And so, this was the first demonstration or this is the kind of a first demonstration a very ingenious design to study attention. Now, as I related before studying attention is difficult because as you say do not pay attention to this people start paying attention. And so, this design has been used in, in a lot of cognitive psychology tasks or a lot of experimental tasks which measure attention. So, the question here is what kind of information do we get from the intended uh, unintended or the unattended here and and whether some information at the meaning level can also bypass the attentional filter. The question to be looked at is whether attention is an is an all or none kind of a filter which means that when you are not uh, when you are not focusing yourself or when you are not use, using attentional filters, uh, uh, whether the one the messages which are not being attended to whether they also pass and at what level, what kind of level do they pass. Now, Cherry's experiment very clearly says that some information or some idea about the non intended message you can hear, but then to what level is what several other theories will argue. And so, there are theories of attention which has been put forward which go ahead and actually talk about what is being attended to and what are the matters being attended to and what part of the non attended message or what is it from the non attended message that people can actually hear. Now, remember in this case in this whole scenario we are talking about focusing our attention on to one ear and we are attending and shadowing it. So, when you are shadowing it, it becomes really difficult job because shadowing requires you to you to repeat aloud whatever is being uh, said and so puts a lot of uh, uh, mental effort onto the working memory. And so, it will be very difficult to actually go ahead and process anything from the non in, uh, attended ear. So, uh, the question whether things from the non attended ear stimuli from the non attended ear also uh, moves back or are also heard. Another paradigm that we will go into further is whether attention is fixed or does it fluctuate. And so, one of the reason that has been given in one of the theories is that attention is never 100 percent and so, it keeps on fluctuated, fluctuating from one year to the other year and that may be the reason why we are able to hear from the other year. But we will lo look at these debates one by one when we move into it. So, let us start with the first theory of attention which is called the filter theory of attention. So, let us start with the filter theory. So, what does this theory actually say? It is a very simple theory which was proposed by someone called Broadbent in the year 1958 and he proposed that there are limits uh, cognitive limits of how much information a person can attend to. Now, if the information available at even at any given time exceeds the capacity of the mental uh, 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 the mental limit what will happen is a filter is designed which will block most information and let uh, let things pass uh, or let those stimuli pass on to which we are paying our attention. And so, it is it's in a simple demonstration I try to uh, look at uh, the or tell you about uh, this theory or the filter theory. Now, another question is on what properties does the filter work? What is the variables which control the filter? So, let us first look at 
what happens here. So, there are a number of messages 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. These are 7 messages which are here and which are impinging onto our cognitive system and this is any cognitive barrier which is there. This is the barrier, uh, the psychological and physical barrier which I was talking about and as I said in, uh, in previous lectures that the most important thing in psychology is to define how uh, physical stimuluses enter the psychological domain. So, this is the barrier which is there, it, it, it could be ear, it could be eye, it could be anything. And so, the number of messages which are impinging onto it, but the amount of uh, uh, co mental concentration, the limitation, uh, the limit is very less, the mental concentration available is very less. And so, what happens? A filter a filter like this is available which basically takes in one message and lets it pass and filters all these messages away. Now, the question is on what properties does the filter work and so, the answer to this has been given in terms of physical properties of the stimulus is what. So, physical properties of the stimuli guide the filter. So, the filter the use of the filter or the variables which control filter is the physical property. For example, the basic acoustics uh, in the DLT decides whether you attend to it or not and these basic acoustics could be location, pitch, loudness and so on and so forth. So, then the, uh, the filter theory goes ahead and says that, that any message which you are not paying attention to will be blocked. Only those message which I have not been put to a limitation to will only get passed on and those are the message which you record. And then the filter which, uh, which filters out these messages uh, is based on something called the physical property of the stimuli which is impinging onto it. Now, the filter theory explains while there is so little of the meaning of the unintended message in uh, Sherry's experiment uh, happened. The meaning from the unintended message was simply not processed and that is why we only get the basic physical features of the unintended ear. Remember Sherry's experiment that we talked a while ago and as I said from the unintended ear things like the basic property of the message whether it is in forward or backward direction or whether it is a male or a female which is, uh, uh, which is speaking this message these were processed, but nothing beyond that. And so, that is what the filter theory goes ahead and says, it accommodates that and it says that these are the only things which can be processed or which is processed through this particular theory, because other features are not being attended to. Now, the question comes that can we not hear or can we not pay attention to two messages at the same time? Can we pay attention to two messages at the same time? Is it that if we are paying, paying, focusing on one message, is it that the other message gets passed on or only physical, basic physical uh, features of the stimulus are registered? Broadband proposed that two messages that contain very little information or that information or uh, if the information is presented very slowly, in this case we can process both the messages. So, what broadband goes ahead and proposes that there are situations in which we can focus our attention or even if we are focusing attention on one message, we can process the other message and that happens in only those cases where either both the years contain very basic minimal information. The messages contain very basic in minimal information or the presentation rate is very slow. Now, in these two cases and in these two cases alone, both the years can be attended to or both the messages can be actually uh, read or perceived. But an interesting thing was pointed out by someone called Moray in 1959 and he stated something called the cocktail party phenomena. Now, what is the cocktail party phenomena? Now, in the cocktail party phenomena, look at the figure on your right. As you see, there are so many people sitting here and it is a large party which is happening, everybody is enjoying, there is large sounds, loud music everywhere. And so, even in these cases and you are focusing yourself onto what your friend next to you is talking. So, this person or these people are actually uh, listening to uh, uh, listening to somebody who is talking among their groups. Now, in the cocktail party phenomena, what Murray suggests is that if your name is said or if somebody's name is uttered, this message even if you are not attending to 
will pass this filter, will pass the filter which the filter uh, theory talks about and that raises a problem. Now, what he says, what More goes ahead and says in the cocktail party phenomena is that shadowing performance is disrupted when one's own name is embedded in either the unattended or the attended uh, uh, ear. Now, this happens as important materials can penetrate the filter set up by uh, set up to block unintended messages. Now, uh, Pashler's experiments say that only all, although only 33 percent of people could actually uh, when they, uh, could uh, actually uh, hear their name when they were not informed before, but then this really happened which basically means that there are certain stimuli out there where which can be processed. When your name is being processed from the unintended ear, which means that it is being processed not at the level of the stimuli, but at the level of meaning, because you know your name has a meaning and when your name is being processed, when somebody is speaking your name, it has a meaning. So, at the level even at the level of meaning, your name or uh, words like fire or words which are uh, 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 more important to your adaptation are processed. And so, one, uh, what the cocktail for party phenomena goes ahead and says that whatever broadband suggested in his theory, filter theory which says that only those messages we are tending to gets passed and processed for meaning, whereas other messages if ever process our process for basic properties is actually wrong. And so, he demonstrated th that through this phenomena where he where he uh, uh, where he showed that people's own name or some important words which are adaptive in nature can be processed even from the unintended ear. So, even if in a big party where you are enjoying yourself listening very hard to your friends and somebody calls your name, it is bound that most people turn around and look at who is calling their name, which means that they are able to attend within that huge voice, within that huge noise into their uh, name. And the reasoning that was provided for this particular uh, feature of the cocktail party phenomena was that attention fluctuates. Since attention fluctuates, since, since the attended ear never takes up 100 percent of attention, the attention keeps on fluctuation between the unintended and unintended ear and that could be the reason why uh, uh, the cocktail party phenomena happens. So, shadowing uh, in Morris term shadowing does not take 100 percent of attention since attention fluctuates between the attended and non attended ear and that could be the reason why you are able to hear at the message level uh, the information from the unintended ear. Now, Anna Tresman actually goes ahead and hits back at or uh, demonstrates that whatever Morris says in terms of attention fluctuation or not uh, or the fact that 100 percent attention is not being paid on to the attended ear, uh, ear is wrong. And so, Anna Tresman designed a very ingenious experiment to test whether the attended channel, the channel, the ear that is being used for uh, shadowing that is being used for reading aloud the words at uh, which is being put into that ear, whether 100 percent attention is being uh, uh, is devoted to this ear. And so, in her experiment what she did was she used uh, the same dichotic listening task in which two ears were there or two uh, the two different ears got two different kind of messages and what really happened is that uh, the message uh, uh, one year was to be shadowed and the other year was not to be shadowed. Now, and in the only interesting thing or the only uh, new thing in this experiment was that in the middle of in the middle of the, the uh, whole listening task the messages were reversed. So, the message on the right ear went to the left ear and the message from the left ear right, uh, went to the right ear. What really happened? The results of the experiment uh, suggest that people who were paying attention or shadowing the left ear and as soon as the message from the left ear shifted to the right ear, they continued hearing the message from the left ear and repeated a couple of words also of the message from when even, even after the message got reversed into the right ear, which means that they were clearly focusing 100 percent attendance. So, at the point when the switch happened, people did not know the switch, people did not follow the switch and they uh, moved or they were able to repeat a couple of words from the unintended ear 
uh, or the messages from the unintended ear after the switch, which basically means that people were paying 100 percent attention into uh, the attended ear and later on as time progressed or after a couple of seconds, uh, people started repeating uh, after the switch messages from the unintended ear, which basically proves that people are able to to um, pay 100 percent attention uh, and that the, the, the reasoning that attention fluctuates is, uh, is, is not so correct. A similar experiment was done by someone called uh, Wooden Conan and so they uh, wanted to test similar experimentation by Wooden Conan and Conway Conan and Bunting in 2001 uh, resulted in showing that messages from the unintended ear was also processed thus challenging the filter theory. And so, what wooden Conan's experiment was that wooden Conan used the same dichotic listening task uh, for uh, their experimentation. Now, they have uh, uh, they gave on both the ears two different uh, uh, film clips to be heard. On one ear you have uh, the grapes of what the dialogue from the grapes of what which was being processed and on the other year from 2000 space odyssey uh, dialogues were from that particular um, movie was being uh, uh, repeated. And so, people there were two group of people who were uh, a able or who were given this kind of a task to be done and a control group was also there. Now, uh, people were asked to shadow the grapes of what dialogue for the grapes of what movie and the words were presented 175 words per minute. So, basically the setup is like this the, the two years here two different movie dialogues the left here is something from the, the, uh, uh, the grapes of what movie and the right here here is of uh, dialogues from 2000 space odyssey two group of people do that there is a control group also uh, uh, which uh, which is there and the word presentation is 175 words min words per minute and people are asked to shadow or repeat aloud uh, the message which comes on the left ear or the ear which is uh, which is hearing the grapes of what now 5 minutes into the experiment 5 minutes after the experiment started uh, the unintended ear, the ear which was hearing 2001 space odyssey dialogue there, uh, there was a reversal. So, uh, the message got reversed or back test a back messaging was done. So, that words were repeated uh, from front to back uh, uh, a back shadowing or a backward uh, message uh, was played into it and that happened only for 30 seconds and later on after that one group heard uh, the or followed on to the original experiment for two and a half minute, one group followed the experiment for one and a half minute and the control group actually never saw or never heard the back uh, messaging into the unintended ear. Now, it was uh, the result what would be the result of the experiment and so, the an experiment like this the result is that people who notice the uh, backward uh, problem shadow uh, uh, the people who actually uh, go ahead and, and uh, notice that there is a backward shadowing on one of the year, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they create or they do more number of errors and this error actually gets generated after the backward messaging stops. Whereas, people who actually uh, do not uh, people who actually uh, uh, do not hear this backward messaging, they never notice that the backward messaging was done. Also, the third group who, who did not hear any kind of backward message, they never heard any, any kind of thing and so, there was that was what was com comparable. Uh, and so, the idea from this is that this, uh, this idea of uh, attention shifting or attention fluctuating between, between two years is not so correct and that was what uh, was related. So, that was the main idea of wooden uh, 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 Conan's theory. So, fil they went ahead and this particular experiment suggest supported the filter theory that when only those messages you are attending to uh, uh, actually go ahead and are processed, but those messages you are not attending to are not processed. Uh, that is the uh, bottom line of the wooden Conan experiment. Now, these are very interesting experiments or these are very interesting theory of attention. But later on another attentional theory or theory of attention 
of how the attention works or how attention goes attention filter goes ahead and looks at cognitive resources or the allocation of cognitive resources to different factors or different cognitive tasks and what are the limitation of this was proposed by someone called Anna Treisman. So, Anna Treisman what she did was Anna Treisman in 1960 proposed a modified theory of attention which is called the attenuation theory. It is a very simple theory to look at. Now, the theory proposes that messages from the unintended ear is not blocked. So, what happens then? Messages from the unintended ear according to Anna Tresman is actually toned down, is brought down or volumed down, is attenuated. And so, what she says is the volume of the unintended message, the, the uh, tone of the unintended message is attenuated or brought down and that is the reason why this kind of an attentional filter really works. So, incoming messages what Anna Tresman then extended her theories to that any incoming message, any incoming uh, information onto the sense organ uh, before the, the attentional filter works onto gets processed through a, a three stage attentional filter. And what are these attentional filters? So, incoming messages what she says are subjected to three kinds of analysis. There is a physical analysis, there is an analysis at the word level and there is an analysis at the meaning level. We quickly look into that in a minute. Uh, now, some messaging units are processed quite easily because they have more adaptation or more uh, adaptive value. Right? And sometimes messages are also processed uh, uh, from the unintended ear. So, some messages from the unintended ear are processed because they have adaptive value like your name, your, uh, your um, uh, uh, words like fire, danger that kind of words because they have adaptive value they, uh, uh, or they, they uh, help you uh, negate a threat. Some other messages are also processed from the unintended ear because they are in context. For example, if on the intended ear uh, you are being uh, played this message dash is chased by the dog and in the attended ear if you have words like cat into it, uh, you will quickly go ahead and hear the word cat. It is something called the context effect. So, sometimes context in which the message is being played, the context of the message also helps us in attending or in processing messages from the unintended ear. So, what Tresman, Anna Tresman says that any message which is being processed, which is being processed through the attentional filter goes through three stage of filtering, three uh, extensive stage of filtering. So, I have a, a drawing here to basically go ahead and show you that how does it happen. So, this is the incoming message, any incoming message at the first level of analysis are the physical properties of uh, uh, sound of in, in terms of sound because since we are looking at the dichotic listening task. So, I have put sound here. What happens is the first level of analysis as is at the level of physical property. And so, here physical properties of the sound or the message which is being relayed auditorily to you uh, in terms of its pitch and loudness is what is being focused on. So, this is uh, where the focus is. If messages pass through this stage, it goes through a second level of analysis where a linguistic or parsing a syllables and words is done. So, if the messages are not filtered at level 1 of attention, which is uh, the attention uh, attention filter uh, dependent or based on the physical property, a second level is a second level analysis, a second level filtering is uh, initiated and at this level what really happens is that the filter is dependent on so the linguistic parsing in terms of <laughs> words and <laughs> syllables. And so, if in terms of words and syllables, the filter operates here in terms of the linguistic property of the word. So, what kind of linguistic property a word has, what uh, whether it is in which context, uh, how many words are there, the differentiation in terms of da, ba kind of a thing, it is it happens at this level. Even if at this level the filtering cannot be done, if there is a problem in filtering or if the filter does not work at this level, a third level of filtering is or, or level 3 analysis is is uh, is uh, run on to or level 3 filter is run on to the incoming messages which is the semantic level. And here if the messages are not blocked or cannot be blocked at level 1 or level 2, a semantic level filter is applied where the messages are blocked 
in terms of the meaning and so here the filtering happens in terms of the meaning what the message has or what is the meaning of the message and in on the basis of that basically go ahead and make the uh, the filtration or the uh, blocking of messages are done in terms of the uh, uh, filtering and what uh, an man goes ahead and says is that the cocktail party phenomena happens because your name or certain other words which are adaptive value have lower thresholds. When they have lower thresholds, uh, they are get processed from level 1, level 2 and level 3 and at, uh, the, at the level 3, if, uh, even at the level 3 at the semantic level, it is the meaning of your name and so it is, since it has very less threshold, it gets processed. Now, what Trisman and a Trisman goes in and says is that people will use these levels of analysis based on at what level they can separate the attended and the unattended here. So, let us say the messages of similar physical property is coming at both the years. So, filtering will not be done here and so a second level will be applied where people will be looked at in or, or both the messages will be looked at in terms of the linguistic properties in, the, in terms of the words in terms of the phrases that is there. Suppose both the messages have the same tone the same physical property as the as well as the same linguistic property only in those terms only in those cases a semantic level analysis will be done. Now, to prove this an attachment did an experiment a dichotic listening experiment where both the years were hearing a message and in both the in, in the attended year the message was uh, uh, was about uh, a particular seashore and the word bank came in some here and on the unintended year the financial structure bank was being uh, produced or something related to the financial structure was uh, being put into. And so, for distinguishing when bank the word bank came in both the years they were having the same uh, physical properties, the same speed, the same word properties, four words, same kind of a thing and so a semantic level analysis, a semantic level of filter was applied and because the context in which the attended message was working on the bank what they were uh, what was being described in the attended message was in terms of a seashore, a bank of a shore, a bank of a sea kind of a thing, a bank of a river kind of a thing a water body and so that was the message which was grabbed and the financial institution which was being grabbed which was being played on the unintended year which also had the word bank was not taken forward and so at this level the kind of analysis or the kind of uh, interpretation was done. So, basically then these are the uh, theories which have been proposed uh, for um, uh, using or for attention uh, studying attention or how does the allocation of attention really uh, works. Uh, another theory which is out there which looks into which adds on to uh, the uh, the uh, theories that we are discussing is something called the late selection theory. Now, this theory is much similar to what the filter theory has and it was pr proposed by someone called Doesh and Doesh in 1963 and what does this theory uh, and the theory was of course, modified by Norman in 1968 and so what does the theory say? Well, the theory takes up some information from the filter theory and some information from an attachment theory and comes up with a new theory and what this theory says is that the filter that Broadman talks about does not happen at the initial stage of processing of a message, but happens at a later stage at a meaning stage and that is what the theory is all about. So, what this theory goes ahead and says is that all messages are routinely processed for at least some aspects of meaning and the bottleneck the filter since in the in the filter theory the bottleneck or the filter, the filter is equivalent to the bottleneck. Think of a bottle and the bo the neck of the bottle basically prevents spillage of information. So, the bottleneck or the neck of the bottle is thought of as a filter and so in the filter theory this bottleneck is towards the top of the bottle and so since it is there what happens is much information does not rush in and so the spillage of information from the inside to the outside is reduced. Now, what uh, Deutsch, uh, Deutsch's, Deutsch and Deutsch's 1963 theory of late selection says is that this bottleneck appears at a later phase of time at a later stage in message processing 
and the bottleneck comes in a later point of time. So, a message important depends on many factors. Uh, how what is what makes a uh, message important according to this theory. So, basically what they say is that most messages are processed through all the stages to process uh, through uh, most of the features and to uh, and to some level of meaning and, and only at the level of the meaning we have this filter or bottleneck coming in. So, if this is how uh, I have the filter theory where this is the bottleneck and later on this is the processing stages. This is if I, ha I can describe the filter theory. The late selection theory says that this is how it looks like. So, all messages are processed early on and later there is a filter a bottleneck which add through the meaning using the meaning as the reason for the filter or meaning being the uh, variable which controls the filter through which a message is stopped or blocked. And so, the, uh, what they uh, have again go ahead and say that there are several other variables which uh, will determine how the filter will work and they say that the content and personal significance of messages are also responsible for this filtration. What is the content of the message and what is the, uh, the, the uh, personal significance of a message. For example, names of people, for example, certain words which are personally significant to people, they have very less threshold and they are not blocked by the filter even at the late stage and for uh, when it is processed for meaning it is let in that kind of information is let in whether you are focusing it or not. And another thing that they br bring into the picture another interesting variable that bring into the picture of attention is something called the observers level of alertness. How alert somebody is that defines how you will process an information or how much information you will be process. The more alert you are the better processing of messages you can do the more attention you can pay, the lesser alert you are, the lower alertness you are showing um, or for example, alertness in, in, in sleep or if you are in a sleep stage, uh, if you are sleeping, you have very low, uh, low level of alertness and so the message uh, will not be processed at, at all. An additional factor is uh, the complexity of the message. If complex messages are there, then these messages will take more resources and so processing will be difficult, but if easy messages are there then even the non intended messages actually get processed. So, in this lecture we looked at what is attention, what are the various uh, uh, factors which determine attention, what are the theories which go ahead and explain attention. We looked at three theories of attention and try to compare these theories of course, we will do a more comprehensive uh, uh, comparison of these uh, methods or, or these uh, theories at a later later stage or later point of time. But this is what we did in the structure, we looked at what is attention, what factors control attention, what is the definition of it and best of all how do we study attention. It is an interesting thing because once as I discussed before, if I say do not pay attention, you start paying attention to it. So, how is it solved and the answer to this is something called the dichotic listening task. So, bye bye, we will meet again in the next lecture and continue with this. Thank you.